Am I good? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, excuse me if I clear my throat. I woke up yesterday with half a voice. I don't feel sick in any way except for my voice. So if I start to struggle, just begin to pray for me. And you guys just go into worship or something if I go silent. <clears throat> but praise the Lord. This morning, um, I want us to go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and the title of my message this morning is Saved by Grace. Everyone say, I'm saved by grace. Now, <clears throat> is anyone else getting an absurd amount of calls that are, why did the word just slip my mind? Scam calls. Is anyone else getting an absurd amount of scam calls lately? Yeah, not just me. I'm getting like two or three a day. And in emails, in texts. Just recently, there was texts and emails sent out from Pastor Rob, our lead pastor, asking for gift cards. If any of you receive those, they're not from Pastor Rob. He doesn't need gift cards. He doesn't need you to buy him a gift card, okay? But there's all these scams going on, you know? And it's a call, it's a text, it's an email. And at first, if you answer one of them, or you get the text, or you get the email, they sound true, don't they? They kind of have a ring of truth to them, like, you think, oh, Pastor Ron needs my help. He, he, he needs me to do something. And unfortunately, someone is taking advantage of a relationship. They're taking advantage of a way of communicating a message. And our world is just full of these scams. I've just been noticing them. And it's created in us this skepticism, or I should say me, but I think in all of us, in our culture, that if there's something good or something free, it's, it's too good to be true, isn't it? Do you ever find yourself in that situation where maybe you'll, you'll hear, you pick up the call and it's the horn of a ship. Anyone else get this one? You've won a free cruise. It's too good to be true though, right? It's, we're, we're conditioned to believe that there's got to be more to this. There's got to be something else going on here. And, and usually we hang up. Or if we've given into it before, we've been burned. And so we don't believe it. And I think if we're not careful, this skepticism and this not believing something that could be too good to be true can creep into our faith. And we might not say it, and we might not outwardly tell others this, but we may begin to attribute this to our relationship with God. And maybe deep down in our hearts, we don't actually believe God's grace. That God has made it impossible for us to work our way into grace and out of grace. I'm going to say that again. You can't work your way into God's grace. Okay? Some of you need to repeat that to yourself over and over again. You cannot work your way into God's grace. And you also can't work your way out of his grace. That's what makes it grace. And so this morning, I want to talk about saved by grace. This is the foundation of our faith. And sometimes we need to come back to the foundation to equip us to run forward with all that God is calling us to run with. Because we can't forget where we came from. And we can't fall back into old patterns. Because God has a plan for our lives. Amen? So Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 8. Can you understand me with this crackly voice? Praise God. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 8, says, God saved you by his what? When you 
believed. Now, if you have one of the old translations, older translations, it says, by grace, through faith. This is the new living. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. Doesn't say when you worked hard enough. Doesn't say when you cleaned up your act. It doesn't say when, you know, you got everything in order and you were able to come before God righteous. When you believed, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. You can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Some of this have us so deeply ingrained in our thinking, we need to have it uprooted by the word of God. That if you perform, that if you do enough good things, that if you read your Bible enough times, that if you pray enough times, that there's an extra measure of grace for you. And that's not true. God has poured out his grace on each and every one of you. And I'm going to talk about this in a second. It's good for you to read your Bible. It's good for you to pray. It's good for you to walk in righteousness. But we do not do it to receive the favor or grace of God. We, we don't gain anything more of the love or the favor or the grace of God. And we have to be so careful. Because this is the foundation. Jesus said on the cross, just before he died, he said, it is what? Finished. It's been done. Your salvation is done. Your sin has been paid for. The grace of God has been poured out. We live in a season of grace. And we are saved by grace. It says, coming back to the scripture, it is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. Everyone say, I'm a masterpiece. But not just any masterpiece, you're God's masterpiece. But if you're God's masterpiece, it means that he chooses how to write your story. He chooses how to paint your life. He chooses the best and what's good for you. And the scripture says that we are God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ Jesus, so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So everyone say, I'm saved by grace. <clears throat> so what is grace? What is grace? Most people will define grace as the unmerited favor of God. It's, it's God giving us a gift that we do not deserve. That is, that is the very definition of grace, is, is receiving something that we do not deserve. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you've come into this place and you've maybe wondered about your eternal security. You've wondered, if I died today, would I spend eternity with God? Would I go and, and, and be with him? God has given you a gift, and it's his grace. And grace is this, that you can be saved just by believing. Just by believing. If you came here this morning and you already know Jesus, I want to remind you this morning, I felt this on my heart as I was preparing, to remind you to continue in the grace of God. See, it's so easy to, to, I shouldn't say so easy, but we come to God in grace, we come to him and receive salvation by grace. But then, if you're like me, we like to pick works back up again. We like to begin to work again for God's grace. 
But we need to continue in the grace of God. The things God has planned for you, the next step in your life, the next step in your family, the next step in your business is in the grace of God. And we need to continue to walk in his grace, continue to walk in the unmerited favor of God towards us for our marriage, for our parenting, for whatever it is that he has for us, and not fall back into works, not falling back into earning God's favor, earning God's grace, earning God's love. You can't work your way out of it. And you can't work your way into it. And so the, de- the definition of grace in the, in the dictionary is this. It's the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. I really like that definition. It's the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. And so the grace of God that was poured out on Calvary, when Jesus came and he died on that cross for you and for me, the grace of God was poured out and released over each and every one of us, not only for our regeneration, which which is our salvation, but for our sanctification. That's the continuing working out of holiness and righteousness in our life. The grace has already been given to you. It's already been given to you. And so I like to use this, this statement to help me remember this. Um, I don't work for freedom. I work from freedom. Because we don't want to go so far as to say, well, God's already poured out his grace. There's no need for me to do anything. Some will say this. And in the scripture, Paul actually corrects a church for falling into this, that, well, if God's grace has already been poured out, then I guess I don't need to do anything. I don't need to evangelize. I don't need to work on myself. I don't need to walk. I don't need to do these things. We don't work for freedom. We work from freedom. Do you understand the difference? You're not fighting to win the war. You're fighting from an already victorious place. So those things in your life that you're struggling with, those, those demonic things, those, those addictions, the, the relationships that you're fighting for and you're, you're pressing into God for, you're not fighting for victory. You're actually fighting from victory. This is the grace of God. It's already done. He's already equipped you with every good thing you need to fight that battle. If you imagine yourself in a battle and and you're on a steep hill, the enemy is at the bottom of the hill and you're at the top. You're fighting from the advantage. You're looking down on the enemy. And you're fighting from above. This is the grace of God that has taken you and placed you This is what the scripture says, on the rock. That's Jesus. And now you have the advantage. And I think sometimes as Christians, we we have the tendency to fall away from grace. We fall away from grace and we get back into earning and fighting and trying to do this on our own strength. And the reality is, you're going to fail. Because you've removed yourself, or at least you've tried to, from God's grace. But you know, his grace is right there to pick you back up. Whatever you're facing today, can I encourage you to continue in the grace of God? This is a really simple message I have this morning. And I wasn't sure how long I'd go because I was thinking, how long will my voice last? But it's doing good. So this is a really simple message, but it's really important that you continue walking in God's grace. It says, you were saved by grace through faith. And so we know grace is a free gift. It's the unmerited favor of God for our salvation and for our sanctification. But what is, what is faith? What does it mean for me to access that grace 
through faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. So the very definition of faith is believing something that you cannot see. If you can see it, it's no longer faith. Because you can now see it. And it exists for you to grasp and to see. But the definition of a faith itself is believing in something that you cannot see. And so we've seen glimpses of God, if you've been a part of this church. We've seen God work in our lives. We've, we've seen him manifest through healings and breakthroughs and, and answered prayers, different miracles that we've seen. But we've yet to fully see God face to face. And one day we will. You know, when we get to heaven, we'll no longer need faith. Have you ever thought about that? We actually won't need faith anymore because God will just be there. He'll be right there and we'll be able to see him. And we'll be able to see him in all his glory. But here on earth, there's a measure of faith that we must apply to access that grace in our lives. Romans 12, 3 says, To each is given a measure of faith. To each is given a measure of faith. So I love this about God. He asks you to have faith. And you might say, well, is not having faith then a work in itself? Some might ask this. That I have to work to have faith to receive that grace. In itself, is that not a work? That I must work to have faith? But no, God's actually given you the faith to receive his grace. Think about this. He's given you the faith for you to believe and to receive his grace. See, every one of you, every single person in Regina, in Saskatchewan, in the world, has faith. They just get to choose what they put that faith in. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but start looking at people through this lens, and you really quickly can discover where they're putting their faith. They might be putting their faith in their own ability. They might be putting their faith in their money and their wealth. They might be putting their faith in their family or an institution or a government or a person. But everyone is applying faith to something. And God gives us the opportunity when we look at the cross, when we come to him, where do you want to apply your faith? Where do you want to put your faith? See, faith in itself is not a work. It is not something that you muster up enough of by understanding enough of the Bible or knowing enough of the evidence for Jesus. Those are all good things. But faith exists in your heart because God has put it there. He's given you faith and his desire is that you would put that faith in him. My grandpa, who many of you know, was a pastor for many years, and he would always describe it like this when he would talk about grace and faith and, and salvation. He'd say, imagine that you want to go somewhere on a wonderful, amazing vacation. Now, everyone has a different idea of where they want to go. So in your mind, just imagine where that is. You want. Some people want to go somewhere warm and hot on a beach. Other people want to go to a mountain, you know, where it's cold and maybe like skiing or something like that. Or Everyone's got a different place they want. But imagine paradise for you, your ultimate vacation. He said, this is, this is how you can imagine it. And God, in his divine grace, has already purchased for you an all-expenses-paid round trip to this paradise. Okay, he's already purchased this, this ticket, this airplane ticket, and it's first class. And, and you get lots of leg room. And all the meals are provided for. And when you get there, the, the room is provided, and all your food is provided, and you won't have to pay for anything once you get there. And, and he's already gone, and he's purchased this for you. He's written your name on it. He set it aside. And, and he would say, this is God's grace. He says, your only part in the whole matter is to just show up and get on the plane. That's faith. 
You're accepting the gift. You're accepting the ticket. You're accepting the journey. Saying, God, thank you. And your only job is to just show up. If you're here this morning, you've never heard the message of Jesus before. You've never heard the good news of the grace of God before. He has paid for you. He has already purchased a ticket for you to spend eternity with him. Eternity. You just need to come and accept the ticket. You just come and get on for the ride. Amen? It almost sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But it's true. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news. Because it is so good. And it is true. And God has called us to accept his grace by means of faith, applying our faith to him, and then to continue in his grace. See, some want to abort the mission. They want to jump out of the airplane with a parachute and start to do things on their own. Because sometimes we're wondering, well, when am I going to arrive? When is this going to happen in my life? When, it, when, when is God going to show up and bring the healing, bring the breakthrough? But we must continue in the grace of God. We must continue to walk in his grace. And faith is believing, believing without seeing but trusting the promise that God says, I have already paid for this. I have paid for your victory. I have paid for your breakthrough. I have paid for your healing. I have, pray, I have paid for your salvation. Amen? God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you cannot take credit for it. When we were at camp, a few of you were there. We were playing this lawn game called Mulkey. I don't know if anyone's ever played it. Keith was amazing at it. <laughs> and um, it's this just simple lawn game where you throw a wooden object to knock over the pins. And there's a rule in the game that if you miss three times in a row, you're out. And I don't remember who exactly started it, but someone got out and people in the group began to chant, grace, 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 grace. <laughs> and so the person got another try. But someone else got out, and it felt unfair not to apply grace to that person too, because grace had been applied to another person. And, you know, kind of the joke was being made that, well, if we're a grace-believing church, then, you know, we, we have to apply this to everyone. And so inevitably, kind of the rule just gets thrown out. <laughs> and that's really how grace is is that if it applies to one it has to apply to all of us it cannot just apply to you or to me but it must apply to all of us and actually grace has removed the rule it has removed the rule that you must attain God's grace. You must attain salvation. You must attain breakthrough. You must attain freedom. It's actually re completely removed that rule. So when it comes to long games, it's not much fun because no one ever gets out. <laughs> but here's the thing. God's given each and every one of us a choice because it's the one thing that God will not take from you and he will not take from me is our choice. And the reason he won't take your choice is because he loves you. And for true love to exist, choice must exist. If I want you to love me, I have to give you the opportunity to love me back. Otherwise, it's not love. And in the same way, God has shown his great love for you. He's poured out his love on you, and he's, he's given you the choice to love him back to believe what he said is true, to accept that grace, to walk by faith. Amen? To walk by faith in the grace of God. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to throw off that old man. The old man is a skeptic. He thinks everything's a scam. Everything 
is too good to be true. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the man C.S. Lewis, but he's a famous theologian, um, lived in the kind of early 1900s into the 1950s or 60s. And he's famous for writing a number of things. His, his catalog of things he's written is huge, and there's so much good stuff. He's, he's been said that he was a theologian that wrote to the everyday person. He wrote in a language that everyone could understand, and he has so many good things that you can read. He was a believer. But he wrote a story, and in this story, I believe it so, so beautifully illustrates the journey of us as believers in accepting the freedom and the grace that God has poured out on us and then walking it out and living from that place of truth. And in this story, there's a young boy. I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but there's a young boy who, as a very young child, was taken captive from his parents. And his mom and dad were actually royalty. They were a king and a queen. And he was taken away, and he was brought up as a slave. But he did not remember his origin. He did not remember where he came from because he was taken away at such a young age. And so he grew up as a slave, believing that this was who he was. This is who he was born to be, and he had to work. And he was treated very unfairly. And he was, he was treated in a way that a slave with a cruel master would be treated. Until one day, he heard that perhaps he could get out of this situation and attain freedom. He heard about a distant land, and so he, he escaped with the help of a few others. He ends up escaping at night from this slave master that he's under. And he goes on this journey in the story of finding his way through the wilderness, through the desert, till eventually he finds himself in this kingdom where actually he first came from, but he did not know this. And when he finds the kingdom and he ends up finding the king and the queen, the king instantly recognizes him. But he's now a young man at this point. It's been many years. And the king recognizes him and calls out to him his true identity and says, you are my son. You've been lost all these years. And he says to him, you, you're the prince. In fact, you are the rightful heir to the throne. But the young man has a hard time accepting this in the story by C.S. Lewis. And if you haven't picked it up already, it's an allegory. But the young man has trouble accepting this. He doesn't want to sleep in the bed of the prince. He doesn't want to eat the food of the prince. He doesn't want to, at first, even be the king, the heir. He feels it's unfair. He feels, I, I could never be this. And even though he's now found out he's royal, he continues, at least for a bit, to live as if he's a slave. Until eventually he accepts that he is the son of the king. He is the heir to the throne. And although he was a slave, he is now free. And he actually has power. And this is the journey of each and every one of us. The enemy swipes us away. And for many of us, and for many of you, you were raised in a situation where you were spiritually slaves. You were slaves to your sin. You were slave to your way of life. You were slave to the lies of the enemy. And at some point or another, we all go on a journey. We all go on this journey through the wilderness of trying to find a better life. Because again, that faith is in all of us. Some have said it's like a God-shaped hole in all of our hearts. And we go on this journey, God, there's got to be more. There's got to be something else. There's got to be more to life than just this, what I've been living. Until eventually we find out that we're sons and daughters of the king. This whole time, 
This whole time, you've been royal. This whole time, you've been the daughter or the son of the Most High King, and you are his heir. That's what the scripture says. You are his heir, and he has called you to live in his palace. And a lot of believers come to that place of understanding. Understanding that I am a son of the king. I am a daughter of the king. Do you know that this morning? You are a child of God. He has called you. And when you apply your faith to his grace, you are saved. And he brings you into his kingdom. He brings you into his palace. He sets a meal before you. He gives you a brand new life. But unfortunately, many believers continue to live as slaves in the palace. We continue to live because we think, that's too good for me. We're skeptics, right? It's like, that's too good to be true. How could God want to heal me? How could God want to forgive me? How could God? And it's not that we're not saved. We actually may even be in the palace. But we're still struggling with the old slave mentality of This is who I am. This is my identity. But I tell you this morning, by grace, through faith, you can accept this, that you are a child of God. You are a prince, a princess, an heir of the kingdom. And when you walk in the grace of God, he empowers you to live this life. He empowers you to walk it out. Amen? The scripture says we are no longer slaves. In fact, why doesn't everyone say that? Say, I'm no longer a slave. Amen. So you don't have to live like one anymore. You don't have to live like a slave anymore. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. I'll end with this. It says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. This is Paul writing. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. He says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Another translation says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Okay, notice it's not saying, Work hard for your salvation. It's saying work out your salvation. Work out of your salvation. Work out of your freedom. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Very next verse, verse 13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I don't know if you got that verse. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God has already gone ahead and worked this all out. He's giving you the desire. He's giving you the power. He's giving you the grace. He's giving you the faith. It's all in you. It's all right there for you to grasp it the desire, and the power to do what pleases him. Very next verse. So do everything without complaining and arguing. Maybe the hardest verse in the whole Bible. (laughs) But you can't quote that verse without quoting the verse right before it. Otherwise it becomes works. Do everything without complaining and arguing. But remember, he's giving you the desire and the power. Go to the next verse. So that no one can criticize you, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. This is God's call for each and every one of us, to be a bright light, shining bright in this dark world, How do we attain it? 
by grace through faith. Can I lovingly remind you this morning, come back to grace. Continue in grace. If you've wandered into trying to achieve on your own, it's a simple message, and I hope you grab a hold of it this morning. Come back to grace. Grace hasn't left you, but sometimes we can kind of veer off. Come back to grace. Continue in grace. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, you can accept him by grace through faith. You just say, Jesus, I believe. It's not too good to be true. It's not too good to be true. It's not a scam. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? And since grace is a gift, would you put your hands out in front of you like you're about to receive a gift? And God's going to place something in your hands this morning. As we posture our physical bodies, it postures our hearts. That's one of the reasons we raise our hands or we bow or we lay before the Lord or we dance. Our physical body postures our heart. And so, God, we thank you for your grace. This is Jigsaw. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, where we've tried to work on our own, we've tried to attain our own freedom, we've tried to attain our own salvation or sanctification, Lord, we come back. We come back to your grace and we apply our faith. We put our faith in you. We put our faith in your grace. We put our faith in you, Jesus, because you loved us so well. You continue to love us so well. And so I pray this morning, would you place a present, a gift, in each one's hand? Right now, Holy Spirit, by the power of your Spirit, would you come? And would you place a gift in each and every one of our hearts? Place a gift in each and every one of our hands. And I just pray the grace of God right now. Just come. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Grace of God, come. Come. And Lord, would you help us to remove that old slave mentality, those old slave clothes. Lord, would you take them off right now and clothe us in your grace? Clothe us in your grace, Lord, that we would know who we are, that we would know who we are in you, who we've always been, sons and daughters, heirs to the throne. So Lord, clothe us in your grace. Just receive his grace this morning. Just receive his grace. Thank you, Jesus. Clothe us with your grace. Clothe us with your grace. If anyone right now has the nagging thought, I don't deserve it. I'm dirty. I'm unredeemable, <laughs> I'm unlovable. If those thoughts are nagging you right now, they're piercing into your mind right now, we rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus. We declare you are lovable, that God loves you. Those thoughts are from the enemy and they're from the world. They're not from God. And Lord, we just pray your grace, your grace, your grace, your grace. We just say grace to it, grace to it, grace to it, 
Grace to your thoughts right now in the name of Jesus. Grace to your life right now in the name of Jesus. Grace to your marriage right now in the name of Jesus. Grace to your body right now in the name of Jesus. We speak grace to mental illness right now in the name of Jesus. Grace, grace, grace. Be applied by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We receive your grace. We receive your grace.